Um, all right, so good morning, everyone. Again, thank you, Dia, for that warm introduction. That um, the, the main topic of discussion today is really looking at something that we're all very familiar with, um, rituximab, or as it's commonly referred to, vitamin R, um, but a closer look at it. Um, again, not to bring concern about the use of it. It's just really for bringing a little bit of awareness about some of the complications that we may not really interact with day to day. Um, and because of some of their rarity, um, they may get a little bit kind of forgotten at times until they happen. And it's good to be aware of really how to mitigate those, how to um, potentially know where to go if that complication happens. And um, that's really the main focus for today. Um, I don't really have disclosures with respect to rituximab or anything we're gonna talk about today, um, but I'll just put this here for just a couple of seconds. I do have research grant from Trevier on the advisory board of some of the pharmaceutical companies. And today we're really going to just uh, mostly focus on some of the adverse reactions associated with rituximab. Again, association is definitely not causation, but some of them, because of the, um, the kind of overall uh, frequency and um, correlations that have been noted over time, the associations are um, uh, to the point that we do, we do um, really relate these to rituximab. Some of the other ones that we'll talk about on the rare side, um, they're really based on case reports and again, association versus causation, um, not quite clear. Um, but a brief just intro to what rituximab is, um, and we're all familiar with this, so this is just gonna be a review for everyone. But um, so it's essentially an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. But what is CD20? So it's a non-glycosylated phosphoprotein that's expressed on the surface of B cells, really anywhere from the pre-B cell stage all the way to mature B cells, but before the, that terminal differentiation into plasma cells. So plasma cells do not express these um, CD20 on their surface. Um, and also with that respect, um, stem cells also don't really express the CD20. So it's really from anywhere between the pre-B cell stage all the way to mature B cells. And the role of CD20 seems to be, um, first of all, it's, it's a calcium uh, channel. And it, the, the role of it seems to be in maturation and development of these, these B cells, kind of assist in, in that development going towards mature B cells. Um, and so rituximab is actually one of the um, first type one generation in, uh, engineered uh, between a chimeric murin and um, human anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. Um, and the, uh, as you see kind of in the pictorial side, the yellow, the constant regions are from human models and the um, variable regions are murin in, um, in origin. A very brief mechanism of action of rituximab. Um, so there are four various ways that it can actually promote the, the cytotoxic uh, nature of the drug. Um, most commonly, the cell lysis happens from an antibody-dependent cell lysis and complement-dependent cell lysis. But in addition to the cell lysis, there can be apoptotic features in phagocytosis that also add on to um, the um, destruction of these, these uh, B cells and, and a kind of elimination of them um, from the uh, peripheral blood. Um, and the, um, this absence from the plasma, uh, from, sorry, from the um, stem cell is really why after the duration of the drug in the system, um, there is actually repopulation of these B cells that can develop um, and, um, and it's not a permanent uh, B cell uh, disruption. But focusing on the main topic of discussion today, these adverse reactions are associated um, with rituximab. And in particular, we're gonna focus on two main categories, the hypersensitivity re related reactions and the secondary immunodeficiency related reactions. And then very briefly discussing some of the other rare complications that are a little bit more organ specific um, in nature. But primarily we're gonna focus on the hypersensitivity related ones and the secondary immunodeficiency related ones. As far as the hypersensitivity relation, uh, uh, reactions, well, it's definitely a whole spectrum of presentations from variety of pathogenesis and kind of background um, causes. Um, the most common that happens is the infusion-related reactions, um, and then it can definitely be more severe as in type 1, type 3, or type 4 hypersensitivity-related reactions, and we'll go through each one of these in more detail. So as far as the, the infusion um, reactions, um, these are the more 
quick onset ones, they're really uh, more of an acute inflammatory response to the drug entering the body um, rather than an immun immunologic response that the body develops against the drug. Um, and these um, are really more cytokine mediated again with that inflammatory response, a rapid cytokine release of IL-6 and TNF-alpha um, in many aspects cause these infusion reactions. They happen very quickly, very often within like the first hour to hour and a half or so within the first 30 minutes or to 120 minutes or so. Um, of the first exposure. And it's good to know that usually they happen again with that first exposure to the drug. So if the drug has uh, been like that first exposure, that first infusion has gone well and the patient has not had any major interaction. Mm -hmm.